Okay, and um, well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, as it was introduced and it says in the program, my name is Sophie. Um, I have a business called York Cocoa House, um, and it is dedicated to chocolate. We're based in York, it is a chocolate cafe where everything on our menu is with chocolate. A chocolate shop where we hand make all of our own products and a chocolate school where we teach chocolate making. And um, I might seem very, very much out of place in comparison to the rest of the programme that you have here today. Um, we have been open three years and um, as I said, everything is to do with chocolate. And um, there's been a massive influx in chocolate shops <coughs> open over the last five to ten years, mostly because uh, a lady from Yorkshire wrote a book called Chocolat. And the book Chocolat detailed this wonderful little French village with a chocolate shop that this woman opened up and went in a great competition with the church as she opened her chocolate shop and all temptations. Women all across England have opened up chocolate shops as a result. It's a very romantic ideal to open up a, a sort of a, a quaint little shop. And that is really kind of the cocoa house the experience that we give people as they come in and join us. Um, it's not, though, just inspired by a book. And that's really what I wanted to be able to communicate and share with you this morning. Um, and to do that, I am going to use a friend of mine that has been a strong companion for over 30 years in my life. And um, it is chocolate itself. <laughs> I'm going to give you a piece of chocolate. And I need you to take a piece, but you're not to eat it. I'd advise you either balance it on your papers or put it on the back of your hand, where it's the coolest part of it. If you could take that plate for me and just pass it on so everybody can have some. by Professor Stephen Beckett. Um, Stephen is an academic in chocolate, he's a chocolate chemist, and I thought there is somebody who is a chocolate professor. What better job in the world could there be than a chocolate professor? Um, that was 14 years ago, and I went to a talk that he gave at the University of York where I was studying at the time. And his talk on the science of chocolate, for me, opened up a whole new world of academia dedicated to a product that I was very much in love with. You're not to eat it. <laughs> I consider myself, I'm not so much a chocolatier, I am a jack of all trades and master of none. Um, I enjoy the science of chocolate, I'm very much inspired by it. It was very interesting to listen to the last talk about gels and jellies and what we can do potentially to increase chocolate's robustness in hot climates abroad and I think there's some very interesting elements there. Um, chocolate itself though embodies a great deal of things. In York there used to be a sign as you entered the train station in York, it said welcome to York and it was like a chocolate bar wrapper of Yorkie and uh, the end of it was torn off. It said welcome to York where the chocolate's chunky and the men are hunky. <laughs> chocolate in York means a significant amount. It is two chocolate factories. We have Terry's and we have Round Trees. Chocolate in York means six million Kit Kats are made every single day. It's a product that was created in York more than 300 years ago. It employed more than 30% of the population in the city. It's a product that fills the city with that odour and smell. So, I'm going to come and put you out of your misery with you. So everyone's got their chocolate now, haven't they? Yeah. Okay, so when I first came to York, there were actual jobs called chocolate tasters. <laughs> I thought, what an amazing job, you could be a chocolate taster. That sounds absolute heavy. <clears throat> so, I'm just going to teach you how to taste chocolate properly. You might think, well, I don't need teaching, most people do. But first of all, what I'd like you to do is look at your chocolate. A good quality chocolate should have a nice gloss and shine to it. It is. The art of the chocolatier is in creating a proper temper to our chocolate. And our chocolate can go together in a number of different ways based on its crystal structure. 
But if it doesn't go together in the right way, it won't have a beautiful gloss and shine. We all know that many of us, we eat with our eyes, and so our temptation starts by how we see our food. A chocolate that is white and streaky, or crumbly and chalky, does not have an attractive appearance to it. So we don't anticipate engaging and enjoying that chocolate quite in the same way. The art of a chocolatier is to temper that chocolate professionally and to get that good quality shine. And a chocolate bar that has sat in the sun or anybody from a hot climate might have seen those chocolate bars that have gone white and streaky or a white shine across it. Whilst in actual fact only the chemical structure of that chocolate has changed, our perception of that chocolate becomes very different. So we eat with our eyes, so I'd like you to look at your chocolate first and foremost. Now, in York, we are particularly lucky because the big chocolate factory is now owned by Nestle and they're producing there by Cargill. They fill the city with chocolate smells on roasting days. Sometimes you can tell whether it's an after eight, after eight day or it's a polo day or it's a chunky Kit Kat day for me. It has particular resonance. But the whole city will smell of chocolate. We eat with our noses as much as anything else. And so when the whole city smells of chocolate, Thankfully, people come into my shop smelling that odour on the air. So what I'd like you to do is smell your chocolate. <laughs> our sense of smell plays such an important role in how we appreciate and engage and enjoy our foods. And we know that if we have a cold, we can't taste our chocolate. But also, there's a unique combination of the salt and sweetness, that umami um, taste that is unlocked in our nasal passages. And unless we fully engage with our foods, with all of our senses, we actually remove our opportunity to engage with our food properly. So we've looked at our chocolate, we've smelled our chocolate. Next, I need you to listen to your chocolate. Now you're going to think that I'm slightly weird, and I really hope that you don't, because I thought of all the groups that might sort of at least understand this, and you would be one of them. Now our chocolate is held together by cocoa butter, and our cocoa butter is a unique property in our chocolate. I operate at the fine chocolate end, but in York we obviously have our confectionery end, which is great, great notoriety for the city. As <coughs> science and technologies and innovation and demand have increased, so too has the solution of what do we do to replace the cocoa butter in our chocolate. And alternative fats have actually come in from its place. The fine quality chocolate market will have you believe that any additional fats added to our chocolate is wrong and bad and should not be tolerated. We've worked with a number of companies though to look at alternative vegetable fats, look at mango butters and alternative fats to see how they behave and see how we can deliver a fine quality product to alternative markets where heat plays such an important role in how our chocolate behaves. Our chocolate's held together by that cocoa butter strength. The more things we add to our cocoa butter, the more we dilute its ability to hold our chocolate together. Much like we have professional crisp tasters that will test the snap and crispiness of our crisps, so too our experience of hearing our chocolate plays an important role in how we engage with them. So what I'd like you to do is take your chocolate next to your ear, and on the count of three, what we're going to do is snap our chocolate. Now, just so you know, and just because I have done this with some very intelligent people before, if you snap your chocolate here, and then put it next to your ear, you cannot hear it. <laughs> I just feel the need to reiterate that. So, on the count of three, one, two, three. Now I certainly heard lots of snaps and I hope that you did too. The quality of the snap of the chocolate does signify some of the elements and characteristics around its character and its makeup. Please don't do though what one gentleman told me he did was to go into the supermarkets and test all the bars of chocolate by snapping them. So we've looked at it, we've smelt it, we've listened to it. Finally I do get to put you out of your misery and you get to put all that chocolate in your mouth at once. Crunch down on it, give it lots and lots of surface area and suck on it. And if anybody has a specific allergy request, this is a dark chocolate. It's 55% chocolate. It does not contain any nuts. It does not contain any dairy or sesame or any other allergens. Suck on it and make sure that every piece of your mouth is tasting and experiencing that chocolate. 
So while you're doing that, all very, very quiet, you're actually the most well-behaved audience I've ever had on this. Um, as you're tasting that chocolate, there is an experience in tasting chocolate. So in York, as I said, chocolate in our city, it means employment. It means history, it means heritage, it's a sense of place. Chocolate for me means comfort. In the morning, it means nourishment and nutrition. In ancient Mexico, the Aztec population, cocoa beans meant money, meant currency. Um, chocolate to many women, it means a source of comfort that is like no other. Some people have linked it to the sorts of feelings and experience you get from feeling and being in love. Chocolate is such an emotional, powerful tool. It can have so many meanings to different people. Yet it is also a multi-billion pound industry that transcends so many cultures and populations. So many people have had an experience of chocolate, no matter where in the world they have come from. Yet they are so very woolly terms. They are just quantitative measures. They're not qualitative. They don't help me get investment from the bank. They don't help me <coughs> sell products in a supermarket. They don't help me be able to prove the viability of my feelings and sentiment towards chocolate. And that is really where we have this challenge. So I'm an artisan producer. I have a small team of staff that work for me that produce our chocolates on a daily basis. We are not about selling chocolate. And that might sound very, very strange. But I was referred to a piece of advice that I was given by a former marketing director at Roundtree. And she said, you do not sell chocolate, you sell happiness. And that's a really quite important point. You've all just experienced, you've just tasted the sensation of chocolate. And chocolate is in the smell, it is in the looking, it is in the taste, but it's also in the feeling and sensation. We sell feelings and sensations. We do not sell a physical inanimate product. We sell a product that embodies and engulfs and envelops many other things. And whilst the banks do not necessarily value that fluffiness, whilst investors, whilst scientists cannot necessarily quantitate, qualitate that fluffiness, we know that it is important. So if we look at cities like Dublin, for example, that has a significant proportion of its tourism based on Guinness. And what Guinness means whenever that Guinness can or bottle is spread throughout the world, it resonates that understanding with Dublin as a place. If we look at Waitrose, for example, the growth of the high-end supermarkets, they've been able to create a sense of place, a sense of identity, which can transcend into financial return. If we look at Betty's, a Yorkshire tea company, a tea house that has traded on its institution and place and position within the market. It has been able to retain its essential Yorkshireness. So we look at elements of how we can grow as a business, and we look at elements of how we can grow as an industry, and say, well, how do we take these really fluffy things and put them into something that is quite sort of physical, which can be quality? And to do that, we've had the assistance of several studies. One of those was by an agency called Nightline, and they look at house prices. And what they say is that the position of our chocolate industry has a direct correlation to the value of our homes. The more independent chocolate shops there are in a location, the higher the value of our homes. That seems a really strange correlation to make. And then we look at the rise in GDP. In this country, as we have had an increase in GDP <coughs> steadily over the last 300 years, so too we have had a direct increase with our spending on sugar and confectionery. So the more money we have had as individuals to spend on things, the more money we have spent on those small indulgences, such as sugar and confectionery and chocolate. And that steadily increased, and that steadily increased at the same time that companies in Europe, such as Roundtree's and Terry's, steadily increased their production, their capacity, and their position in market share, until the 1980s. And in the 1980s, we had had so much affordable income so much ability to spend on chocolate. We started becoming less price sensitive. 
we stopped buying as much chocolate and confectionery as we could. Now, we can liken that to our experiences going to the shop with our pocket money. And it's really, it's such a very special position for us to be in when we see a child come in with their first pocket money that they've been given to independently spend on their own things as they wish. And they choose, they go around the shop and they look to see what they want to purchase. It's very special at Christmas when they're coming in to buy something for their mother or father and they're looking very diligently to see what special thing that they can buy for them. And we see it still time and time again. As a child, when they have a pound to spend, they would spend that pound on sweets. When they have two pounds to spend, they might buy it, spend it on sweets and crisps. If they have five pounds to spend, they might buy it on sweets and crisps. Or maybe, actually, they'll start deciding what else they can spend their money on. Now, that's a child today. That's also happened within our growth of, as a consumer and our power and position of consumer, over, certainly over the last 30 years. It's now put us in a position where people are no longer discerning based on price. <coughs> people are no longer discerning how much they can get for their money, how fast, how cheap, how big, how much a company can produce is no longer the deciding factors in how a company can grow. We now have the impacts of fair trade. We now have the impacts of ethics and values and so many other decision-making elements that go into our consumer purchasing behaviour. And it's that backdrop, those more sociological factors, that we have applying to us, that as a small business, we can innovate around. Now, I started my business in my own kitchen. I started my own business, I made chocolates, um, I was making them mostly till three or four o'clock in the morning. I would go to market at seven o'clock the next morning. I would hope to God that I'd not sold everything, because if I did, I would have to go back home and make again that evening. There becomes a ceiling in which you can reach. You can't move above it to go into greater production. And that is one of the issues with artisan quality. When we start putting quality above quantity, we reach a ceiling and we reach a point. In our observations of Terry's and Roundtree's, we start seeing the point in which they started putting quantity above quality. And it's usually at a point when the boards are no longer filled with family members. They're usually at a point where family values, ethics, and your original purpose is no longer underpinning the growth decision and direction of your company. When we first opened up, we put chocolate on everything in our menu. It still has chocolate on everything in our menu. We were a quaint little chocolate shop and cafe, and people came in and they wanted toasted tea cakes and cheese sandwiches. And I had to say, we don't offer toasted tea cakes and we don't offer cheese sandwiches. We offer the best chocolate dishes you'll ever taste. Some people stayed and some people went. Some people now, they come in. I never get asked for toasted tea cakes or cheese sandwiches. They know what is on our menu. And I know full well that I might have had a more profitable business if I put on toasted tea cakes and cheese sandwiches, but I wouldn't have had the business that I wanted to have. And those are the challenges where science offers us an amazing opportunity to really look at how we can grow our businesses and scale our businesses. And that's why I love being engaged with organisations like this, to see where our opportunities of growth are. Because unless we can reconcile that conversation between the artisan and the industry, we will have two very disparate industries that we can't reconcile together. innovation and so so much of the innovation that we have certainly seen over the last 30 years is really being driven by market forces and so it's very interesting for us to reflect we do a lot of partnership work with the Biorenewable Centre at the University 
I'm very interested to see how can we can um, chemically make up alternative compounds for chocolate. So, for example, if we can deconstruct the amino acids and the raw acids that go into that complex chocolate flavour, can we recreate it from alternative sources? And we certainly need to see, as more emerging economies are coming through, the key driver for chocolate innovation at the moment is certainly in being able to make a more robust product for markets like the Middle East, China, and Russia, and the BRIC countries, where we're seeing Again, as I sort of go back to that sort of purchasing and consumer decision making, we're seeing much more freedoms in those <coughs> economies. Personal freedoms, individual freedoms, and again we're seeing a strong correlation with their propensity to spend on confectionery and chocolate. So certainly one of the key innovations that is being driven by the market is to make sure that we can create a product that is suitable for those economies, whilst also creating all of those things that I was able to deliver to you today, because we have the right environmental factors here. So that is where the market will, will grow those, and there's a lot of investment being made in that direction. Um, but back at home, we need to kind of reconcile this challenge between supply and demand, because we have greater demand in the industry from those countries, yet we have challenges with supply with a lot of the Ghanaian stock kind of coming to a natural end. We've yet to see what the Ebola crisis will kind of play out um, and its impact in the industry at this time. So the, there are a number of things in whether what we think should happen and what will happen will be driven probably much more by market forces than uh, yes, and it's certainly something that's happening much more, and there's more investment into um, smaller communities. So we work quite closely with the community in Grenada, where they are actually doing more of the processing themselves. So this is kind of seen as one of the solutions. I think one of the more innovative solutions will be for us to see how we can transcend some of the comparisons with the wine industry. So for example, in the wine industry, you have lots of small vineyards, and then you have one anchor sort of uh, winemaker in that region. And I think that's the sort of model that is uh, being practiced in countries like Madagascar. We work with a company there that is, is trying to ensure we've got a greater uh, connectivity, but it needs to have more consumer understanding and that's why our, our business is very consumer-faced to help us be able to negotiate and discuss that further about the chain. One last quick question from the white uh, Yeah, it, it wasn't so much a question, it was just a, a note of caution really. Uh, you were talking about creating chocolate from other sources. Um, chocolate has quite strict regulations on, on what can actually go into it. So I would just say, um, you know, don't temper with it too much. It does, but it's all complete rubbish. It's <laughs> all complete rubbish. It's been made up by the Belgians, apologies, <laughs> but they're trying to protect their industry. If I told you about the whole bat complexities of chocolate, you would see it's just anarchic. It is just complete codswallow, in my opinion, because it's all been built on an industry that is protecting itself. And it does. It is not about open source. It is not about choosing the right direction for it. It's all about protectionism and control of the market. So we, we have an opportunity, but it's only by small people working together, working with scientists, to say, well, actually, this is a fallacy. Mm, I'll, I'll be a bit careful with that. I, I, I have sympathies, but they would say it's to protect the consumer from the people who take out the valuable coping. <laughs> oh, that's true. But there's, there's components of how can we create the complexity. So, for example, could we look at different fruits to be able to element it? There's elements of it that are very true, but there's still a lot of innovation that could still happen um, to understand the complexities of that. Yeah. So, okay, thanks very much indeed. Appreciate that. Thank you.